What's up, everybody? Welcome to this uh, Q&A. Let me give you a quick vision for what we're doing here. Uh, this is not a prepared statement, and so uh, I'm, I'm planning today to just share some extended thoughts on a number of the questions that have come in from, from uh, Grace folks. And again, it's, it's kind of a follow-up on the statement that we released last week about reopening uh, our church, but uh, there were a lot of questions that came in just about all kinds of things from this COVID disease and, and uh, theological questions and personal questions. And so uh, we're just going to take an extended time here to, to work through those questions. And uh, we're going to try to do this in a format where you can chapter it out so that so that you can jump from question to question. And so if there's only a couple of the questions you're interested in, you can go straight to those and uh, not have to listen to the whole thing. And I just want to say, too, I didn't get to all the questions that came in from Grace folks, and uh, some of the questions were very personal, and so we tried to get the more general, kind of universal ones uh, to answer here. But um, I- I'm also going to probably try to answer some of those more personal ones either on my Instagram story or Facebook story, something like that. But usually when we release a statement at Grace, we try to be very precise in our language uh, to, to try to get that message out to the most people in the most succinct way. And uh, this is going to be a little different than that, a little different than what you're used to. So we're looking more for a long form uh, approach here, more like a, a podcast that's, you know, an hour or so long. And um, I, we just thought it was important to give you a little bit more access to what I'm thinking uh, beyond just the statement that we released. And, and, and so yeah, I've been talking to a lot of people. This is I'm not an expert on any of this stuff necessarily, but I've been talking to pastors around the country, pastors around our state, doctors, government leaders. I've been reading a ton about this stuff. And, and so uh, I'm just going to kind of let my mind go uh, today as we talk about these things. So if you're uh, settling in for the long haul, get a cup of coffee ready or get on your treadmill or whatever it is. And, uh, and press play. If you're, if you're uh, uh, not in the form of that, you can go ahead and skip to whatever you're interested in in terms of questions. So here we go. I'm just going to read the question and then, then we'll, we'll, uh, we'll ramble through. So the first question that I just wanted to answer, it was kind of personal to me and to our staff, is just how are, how are you guys doing? And uh, I just want to say up front here, we, we, we have the best staff in the world I'm just telling you guys at Grace that the team that we have assembled here is incredible. And so to watch how people have responded to this and uh, kind of, you know, taking care of their families or or whoever they need to at home, and then also really lean into what God has called them to here at Grace has just been incredible. You know, and I I look back and think, you know, we've really been set up to do this. Uh, Just very recently, we moved to Office 365 and trained our, our whole staff in doing that last year. And uh, man, I, th- I thank God that we did because that's been such a lifesaver as we're communicating with each other, you know, on, on video chats and, and all the stuff that we're, we've had to move our meetings to. And so anyway, we haven't missed a beat. Uh, a lot of us are busier than we've ever been uh, on staff because it seems like we've, you know, had, I, I know for me, I, I plan a long time ahead uh, for my sermons and other things. And so just to, to, to look back and go, man, I have... I feel like I've done a few months worth of work and now we're here and I that doesn't make sense anymore and so I have to redo that work plus do the work of the present plus think about the future in a different way and so uh, yeah it's been it's been a little bit overwhelming uh, for our staff but we we just have rock stars here and um, you know I'll talk about my family just for a second the family's doing really well Um, we've stayed pretty busy through this whole thing Uh, Kim uh, is you know as many of you know is a contractor and show so she's had some work that she's been able to continue to do um, through this and our kids have been able to help out with that stuff. And so Aiden and Chase, our youngest two, have, have stayed busy. And uh, our, our oldest son, Caleb, I went and got him uh, down in North Carolina as soon as this all began to bring him home from Duke. And uh, luckily he wasn't living on campus, so he was able to gather all his, his stuff and we moved him back here. And he's in a, he's in a house here in town. He started his, uh, his job, post-graduation job, uh, this week, and, and so he's he's doing really well uh, too, and he's on this big kind of self-sustaining kick. So he's uh, this is <laughs> this is my child who was never in the kitchen. He's baking his own bread. He has chickens that are laying eggs. He has greenhouses that he's set up to grow his own food. And so, you know, I think there, there's a lot of people kind of on that kick right now because we're saying, man, what happens to the food supply? What happens to all this? So, so he's down the road. We'll see how much of that continues once he has a real job. But it's 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 good. It's good stuff. So our family's doing well. Um, just just personally, this this week uh, has been a heavy week for me. Um, 
uh, I think it's just, it's caused me to do a lot of introspection. Uh, some of you may know uh, Pastor Darren Patrick. He was pretty well known across the nation, uh, committed suicide this week. And it's, it's been a string, man, of like, I don't know, a half dozen or so of large church pastors that either had a fall or a suicide or something like that uh, that have happened in the last year or so. And um, so it's just weighed heavy. It's made me do some introspection about what, what you know, what, what's going on, why is, why is uh, that happening so much, and trying to figure out my own response. I just had a really good talk with a friend yesterday about, uh, about what, what that means for me, how do I lean into uh, friendships and relationships more often. I'm, I'm not certainly at risk of any of that uh, stuff, but, but there are risks uh, of isolation and, and kind of going where we're going in leadership. So anyway, uh, that, that's, a, that's a heavy burden. You can p- pray for Darren's family and, uh, and just pastors everywhere. I'd, I'd encourage you to pray for pastors everywhere. I think uh, people don't understand what a, what, a, what a complex job it is um, to be figuring all, all this stuff out, and especially in this new reality of figuring out what to do. And there's a lot of pressure to open or not open, and, and uh, pastors are going through it right now. So I would encourage you to pray for pastors. But overall, uh, we're doing great. Um, my family is doing really well, I, 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 um, and I pray for all you guys, too, that you'd be doing well as well. So here, here's the next question I want to talk about. It just I want to talk about what about the coronavirus. So we got uh, some questions about, you know, what is this? What are we doing in response to this? And so let me just uh, opine about what we know about this thing for now and how we're responding. So let me just remind you that we are um, living through a global pandemic. And that may seem obvious, but it seems like all the news that's come out lately, you know, is this fake? Is it made up? Did it manufacture? Whatever. We are living through a global pandemic. We know that for sure. We also know for sure that it is impressively contagious, uh, this contagious respiratory disease. And it's called the novel coronavirus because it's called novel because it's the first time it's ever circulated in humans which means that we have no pre-existing defenses to, to this disease. And so whenever that happens, a disease like that kind of has to run its course through whatever population it's been exposed to. Unfortunately for us, it's been exposed to the whole world. We also know that it's particularly hard on elderly people, um, immune-compromised people, vulnerable people of a variety of, of persuasions. And so, the, and here's the thing that I think we have to remember about this, and, and it may have gotten lost but along the way. The, the thing that makes this so dangerous is the long and silent period of contagion. That, that, again, that hasn't changed. We've known that's been true from the beginning, which means that people can be carrying it without knowing that they're sick. And again, this is very unusual. It's very unique. Normally when you're sick and when that disease becomes contagious, you know it. But what makes this so dangerous is you can go around for a couple weeks and have it and not know it and, and, and be spreading it that whole time. And, and so, you know, I think one of the reasons for masks and everybody's, you know, figuring out masks and all that kind of stuff. By the way, I got this doozy. This is a uh, cat mask that someone sent in anonymously. I've been wearing it faithfully ever since. Uh, most of you know my love and adoration for cats. And uh, so I wear this proudly on my face uh, every day. And whoever made it for me and sent it to me, you could make yourself known, and that would be cool too. But um, masks, you know, people are uh, we're wondering about masks. And here's the thing, again, I think it's just common knowledge. The masks aren't protecting you. So, I, I, so I've heard people say, well, I'm not, you know, I'm not worried about myself or my family. I'm not wearing a mask or whatever. That's because it's not about you or your family. The, the masks don't protect you from the de- disease. The masks are protecting everyone else for the de- from the disease because you could have it and not know it and be contagious. And so that's why kind of these preemptive measures that seem a little ridiculous because it seems like it's not doing much of anything is actually helping other people. It's not there to protect you. And so when you go out and wear a mask, it's kind of like saying, hey, forget you all. I only care about myself. And again, I don't think that's a posture that we want to be in as Christians. So we also know about the disease that it's a little bit, I heard one doctor call it wimpy that it's a wimpy disease, that disinfectant kills it instantly. And so this whole washing the hands thing and using Clorox wipes and all that is very highly effective against the disease because it doesn't hold up against those things. Um, I think that we've uh, come through 
the initial wave really well. And so, you know, I know we said uh, early on that the biggest danger was kind of overwhelming our healthcare systems. And that's what we hear, you know, this flattening the curve and all that. The flattening the curve was really about just making sure that our hospitals don't get overwhelmed with people so that people are dying unnecessarily. And, and I would just say in our area, um, man, it's been, it's been reasonably great. It's, I think overall the disease has been less deadly than projections. And, you know, I think one of the things that we're all realizing and finding out is that the data seems to be largely unreliable. So how many people have it, how many people are dying from it, how many people have been tested, all that stuff is, is, is a bit of a moving target, which makes our, our minds spin a little bit. But, um, and I just wanna be, I just wanna be clear that, because uh, I think people are making all kind of assumptions about what I think about this. I, I think we should open the country, like I really do. I think that, you know, at some point here, and we may have already crossed this threshold, um, there are gonna be more deaths from the economic impact of this than, than from the virus itself. And, you know, I know that that conversation has been, you know, framed as, you know, do you care about people's lives or do you just care about money? And it's not, it's a false dichotomy. It's all about lives because the, the reality is that allowing people to go back to work and opening businesses back up isn't just about money, it's also about lives. Both things are about lives. Because pretty soon, and if you don't think so, you don't know much about economics. Like it, it eventually, if the country stays closed for too long, that again, the vulnerable people in our society are gonna be greatly at risk because um, there's gonna be no food, they're gonna, and it's already happening. There's food shortages, there's, you know, the poverty rates will start to skyrocket and things like that. And so, anyway, I, I do believe, and, and listen, I'm married to a, a small business owner, so I'm seeing the effect in my living room of what's happening to, to small businesses. And uh, man, once that goes, that, that kind of removes the heart of our society. And so, yeah, I, th I think we need to very carefully um, very diligently begin to reopen things because to be closed for much longer is going to really cause major, major problems down the road. And, um, you know, I, I, th I think the worry about that just with, with our country is we've, we've chosen a, an approach. So every country kind of chooses an approach. So South Korea uh, chose an approach, and their approach was to test everybody. They literally tested everybody from the beginning, and they're doing this high tracking thing. I don't know if you've read about South Korea, but man, if you go into that country, you get an ankle bracelet that you have to wear, and they track you everywhere you go until you leave that country. And so that's the approach that they took. Um, if you saw some of the videos from China early on in Wuhan and other places, I mean, they, they, this is an authoritarian uh, government, and so they took this very aggressive surveillance approach. And, and if people had it and, and weren't admitting it or whatever, I mean, they, they were literally putting people in cages, they were, you know, putting, closing people into their homes so that they couldn't come out. And, and so that was the approach that they took. Sweden, uh, Sweden took a different approach. They've been fairly open. I mean, they did social distancing, they did masks, they encouraged people to stay home, but they kept their schools open and all that. And, and again, that, that's a strategy. They've had much higher death rates than some of the Nordic countries around them, but their ec economy has stayed fairly strong. Their hospitals have stayed, you know, unencumbered. And so, um, you know, that's a strategy. But every country kind of chose a strategy. In the U.S., our strategy was to lock down. And whether that was right or not, we can argue. But I, I think what, I, what I'm thinking or what I'm, you know, pondering is that you know, we have to continue to, to think through that strategy. If it's to lock down and to flatten the curve and to slow the spread to a manageable number, I mean, that's kind of where we are. And so if we're gonna continue with that strategy, now's not the time to change halfway through. And again, if we're gonna continue with that strategy, then it's a lockdown, but then it's a gradual and safe reopen. And I think that's just where, where we are. And we need to protect ourselves against a second wave of this thing. Um, and so some of you say, well, okay, Derek, if you think that we should, you know, that, that we should be reopening, you know, the country, then why are we not opening our churches? So let me talk about another question and talk about just what are the factors in grace resuming our services? So you probably by now have heard our statement that uh, we're going to be waiting until at least the end of June uh, before we reopen our, our buildings um, and, and I think, you know, let me, let me just back up. I mean, there's a lot that goes into this. I, I heard a great phrase that said, you know, this is, this is not an interruption, this is a disruption. 
So an interruption is when something happens and then you go back to normal. You know, you pause for a little minute and, and then they go back to normal. Well, a disruption is when everything changes. And I think we're in a disruption right now. And when it comes to reopening our church, I mean, one of the biggest considerations, that, because it's easy to look around and go, well, all these other churches are opening up. One of the biggest considerations is, is our size as a church. And again, it's a great thing. It's a, I'm proud of us for that and all that. But uh, it also, in this case, becomes uh, trouble uh, because we have a lot of people to pack in uh, to rooms. And so it's a huge consideration. And, and I just don't, I don't want to mortgage our future uh, to rush back. And, and here's what I mean by that. You know, people are, people are saying, well, you know, all, here's, the, here's the thing. We, the stats are in and only a small percentage of people die, you know, from this who, who get it. And, and I, I've said to people along, you know, the people who are saying that are obviously not leading large organizations. <laughs> because when you lead a large organization and you think of a, just a small percentage of the people will die, like those are, there's people on the other side of that. This is, this is we're talking about real life people. And, and so, you know, that's a factor that, that we have to consider. And I don't want to mortgage our future. In other words, I don't want the reputation of our church for years to come to be, oh, that was that church that opened up and a bunch of people got the coronavirus and died. Like, I don't think it's worth it right now for us to kind of rush back into it um, and mortgage our future on that. And so, you know, we've been really using just a few factors as we think about what, what would go into reopening. And I want to break these down a little bit more for you than I, than I did last week. So um, the first is safety. Just, you know, what does it mean to open our buildings safely? And so there are some requirements that we're getting from the CDC, from our state government, of what it looks like to... to, to you know, have safe environments. And so, you know, we're having to think through things like <laughs> that we never did before. Sanitation stations, we have some on order. They probably won't be here till June. Things like foggers. When I first heard of this, I, I, I immediately pictured the video game Frogger. I thought somebody said Frogger. I'm a true child of the 80s. We have to think about cleaning rotations, like between times that people are in our building, what does cleaning look like in between? Uh, what entrances and exits can people come out of so that we don't have crowds congregating in one place at one time? And so we, we've got a lot of work to do and thinking to do about what does it mean to open our buildings safely. So safety is a big one. The, the second one, and this is one I, I'm not sure a lot of people have thought about, is just uh, quality. So I think there's everybody, including me, uh, we have this nostalgia about church and, and so, like, I want to go back to church. I want to go back into that room. I want to have the worship pump in, and I want to hear a live sermon and all this stuff. And we have this nostalgia. And um, I want to be careful about nostalgia because here's the, here's the deal. When you come back with what we, we would have to come back to if we did this soon uh, is nowhere near that picture that you have in your mind. I'll just relate it to this. My, my wife, Kim, is a, uh, she loves Wegmans, the grocery store, and, and it kind of has a nostalgic quality to her, almost a romantic quality. Those of you Wegmans lovers know the, the kind of the hold that Wegmans can have on you. And uh, she can't go to Wegmans anymore right now. She's, she's kind of going to a different store because she said when, when she goes in there, it's so depressing because she had this fond memory of what going there to shop was like. And when she goes in there now and sees the one-way signs and people with masks and just what we've become, it's just this stark reminder to her of, uh, of how crappy this is. And... Um, you know, I, I think when it, there's this nostalgia about coming to church, but when people actually come to what it is that we could produce right now in the near term, man, I think you'd, you'd come once for the novelty of it, and then you're like, I, I'm not sure I want to do that again. It's too depressing. And it certainly wouldn't be a thing that you would invite your friends to, you know. And, and again, that's part of our goal in doing what we do. And so we're seeing a lot of traction right now online with people attending. We're able to put out a quality worship experience. People are inviting their friends. We're getting stories of people whose lives are being changed through that. And so, you know, we, we want to be very careful that the quality of what we can offer live kind of matches the, the quality of what we can offer online. And when that happens, I think that's going to be a trigger for us to say, okay, you know, it's time to go. If you've ever been to a theater or whatever that, that's, that's half full or try to watch a play when you sit in a room that only has, you know, 20% full, you know, when, when it comes time to laugh, nobody kind of laughs. And it, it's just this awkward experience. And, and we just want to be 
We want to be mindful of that as we think about reopening our buildings. You know, another factor is the kids, the kids factor. And so, you know, how do, you, how do we do kids ministry? How do you have kids social distance? How do you have kids wear masks? What's that experience like? What would that be like for volunteers to be in a room with kids? How many parents would actually even want their kids, uh, you know, to go into a room by themselves right now? And if they don't, that also means that the kids would be coming into the, to the worship space with the adults, which is a whole nother, another thing. And so, um, you know, kids, what we do with kids is a major factor. And so, you know, we've kind of been following along, again, what some of the state guidelines are for that. And as long as schools are closed down, as long as preschools are closed down, we really have to think twice before we kind of open a kid's experience. And that's a big part of who we are. I mean, we're, we're very much a young family church. And so it's a, it's a major consideration. The last thing, and this is kind of a little bit ancillary, is just, just this idea of singing. Um, you know, obviously, when we get together in groups, we want to sing. And, um, you know, I, I'm sure some of you have seen the studies, but I actually read a, an academic paper on this because it, 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 it's actually prevalent as it relates to this disease, that enclosed spaces where people are raising their voices, where there's boisterous activity, are actually one of the worst spreaders of this disease. And so, you know, you, you heard the story probably of the, the choir in Washington where, you know, 50% of the choir got it, several people in the choir died. They took precautions, but they were in a room together singing. And, and man, that, the air clouds that are produced as a result of that, I don't know if you ever held your hand up in front of your mouth as you sing, but you, 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 you spit out some stuff there. Uh, South Korea, they, they traced one person, one of the super spreaders in South Korea, one person to led to hundreds of other people who had the virus because they went to a church service. Um, you know, there are not even churches, but other crowds. There's, a, there's a, a, a bar, a tavern that one of the people went to, I think it was in Austria, that, uh, that they do a lot of singing, you know, around their beer or whatever, and that person had spread to it, just a ton of people in, in that area. And so, um, you know, we want to be careful about that. We want to think about that. And if we can't get together and sing with all our might, um, man, we want to we want to th- consider that because we're a singing people. Now, all that being said, all that being said about you know why we believe that it's not smart for us right now to regather, I, I also need to say on the other hand of that that the, the, I believe to my core that the church is is an embodied movement. The incarnation of Jesus shows us this, that he, he comes from heaven. It's not just this spiritual thing, that's this embodied thing. And so we need to get back together at some point. I mean, I think somebody asked the question, you know, how long can this online thing go on? And, and my answer is not forever. Like, I, I do think that the church has to be physically together. And so some of the things that we're doing, while we're not going to be moving our uh, weekend worship to our buildings, uh, we are going to try to do some special things along the way, some special events that we might do. Um, we might do some watch parties even uh, at some point in our buildings where people can come together and watch services uh, together. We, we're going to do some special events. We, you, we did the Mother's Day event uh, drive through parade last week, and so that was really cool to see the, the faces of people and all that. So I do think there's a way for us to be in proximity to, we, to each other. You know, some, some happened about, or some asked about the, um, you know, some of the drive-in services that, that they've seen other churches do. And obviously we've considered that. Um, our, our issue is just parking lot size for the number of people that we have. How many things would we need to do? How would we control who comes when? Um, and, and really then there becomes a time and energy thing of saying, whew, okay, at some point we're going to have to cross back over and put the majority of our time into what we do physically versus what we're doing online. And it's kind of like when that day comes, it's a no turning back moment. And so when, if we move to doing drive-in services, for example, we're going to have to shift our staff from putting their time and energy to what we're producing online to what we're doing live in those parking lots. And then it becomes what's more effective, what's reaching more people. And, uh, you know, that's a, that's a big consideration. But I, I, I want to use this opportunity as we think about reopening the church, to just press us to say, what is the church? And I think we have to have a more robust uh, ecclesiology, a study of the, of the church. And these services that we do are, if you look through history, it's kind of a modern invention. And we have to look at how, how 
tied have we gotten to those public services? Discipleship, I mentioned last week, it's, all, it's always had three main components. It's had information, it's had the gospel, it's had the Holy Spirit, and it's had community. And none of those three things have been taken away from us. We, we can still be the church. We can still grow in discipleship. And, and I've said for a long time, life change happens best in small groups, and we still have that opportunity. And so I'd urge you to get into a group. Um, man, life groups, you know, I, here's something that we didn't say. Kind of publicly we're saying we want groups to continue to meet online as, as you can. We also recognize that you can use your discretion right now with groups of 25 being able to gather. Um, you're not going to be able to use our buildings yet because, like I said, our buildings aren't quite ready to receive people from the outside other than our staff. Um, but, you know, if you wanted to go to a picnic grove and, and socially distance and wear some masks just so you could be in one space together, if you wanted to do a bonfire outside, outside's better than inside, um, man, use your discretion when it comes to that. Uh, that, to that stuff. And some people say, well, you know, what about, this, uh, what about this passage in the Bible in Hebrews where it says, don't forsake gathering together, you know, don't give up meeting together. Um, and, and they interpret that passage to mean that means that we have to be in the building on the weekend. Well, I would just push back and say that's not what that meant to the original audience. Uh, when they first heard those words, don't forsake gathering together, they weren't thinking about a weekend worship service in a building. They were thinking about a house church where they could go and find genuine community, when they could sit around a circle and share at a deep level and not hide from each other. And that was where their mind went. And I believe that at some level, that's where our mind needs to go right now. Don't forsake gathering together, that's true. But right now that means a Zoom meeting or it means a bonfire at your, at your life group's house. And so, um, and, and as we look back at the Bible, as we look back at history, Guys, God often did more in the scattering than he did in the gatherings. God has always used these disruptions, you know, to press forward his mission. And so, you know, there's the, the, the European missionaries that got kicked out of China early on. You know, they, they, they left and, the, and the, the, the Europeans who had sent these missionaries over were, were saying, you know, geez, that, it stinks that we can't be in China anymore, but at least we have religious freedom in Europe. At least the church can continue to grow and thrive here. And guess what happened on the heels of that? The Chinese churches with no missionaries there continued to grow and thrive in this scattered house church kind of movement, while the church in Europe, who had all the religious freedoms, continued to die. And so... I think our challenge right now is to continue to figure out what's most important, what is the church, and how do we continue to do church in a new way. And, um, you know, I, I know that our staff has been making calls all through uh, the church, and we want to make sure that there's no one left behind in this. And so if people don't have internet or don't have good internet, we, we want to continue to figure out ways to, to keep you involved. So if you know someone like that, if you are someone like that that's watching this video because you got it in your email, but, but you don't have great internet, please let us know, and uh, we'll, we'll make sure to try to make some provisions. We don't want anybody to be left behind. And we, we've, just, we've just heard such great stories about this, about what's happening so far. I just talked to somebody this week who said, you know, I have a best friend who, who I've invited a bunch of times to Christmas of the Warner and other things, and they would never come, never come, never come. And all of a sudden, she, she tuned into one of our services a month or so ago, and uh, she said she hasn't missed a week. And she just told her friend on the phone this week, she said, I think grace is saving my soul. It's just incredible to hear. I heard of another person that emailed me from, from Easter that just said, hey, I, I, I was flipping around the channels on my TV at Easter and I walked by the station and, or you know, went by the station and I heard you say, wait for it. And so I paused and I waited to hear what you would say next. And she said, I got drawn into the whole rest of the, the service and I committed my life to Jesus. We had somebody who, who has a friend across the other side of the country, a cousin who, who uh, he'd been praying for and God had been bringing him to mind. And, and all of a sudden he, he was prompted to call him, but put off calling him and, and his phone rings and it's his cousin on the other end. And, and he used the opportunity to invite him to one of our online services because we're no longer bound by geography. And, and all of a sudden, the cousin is, is tuning in on a regular basis to hear what God might say to him. And so, you know, we really want to lean into this time because we, we see God changing lives as a result of it. And uh, so that's the long answer about reopening the church.
So some of you have asked, how are our finances at Grace? And, and here's what I'll say. I, I'm just so proud of our church uh, and our team. So we've met budgeted revenue for March and April since this, uh, since this COVID began. And uh, we didn't meet it at the same pace that we were expecting to, but we, we, we met it. And uh, that's really, really cool. Um, and we also, at the same time, cut about $150,000 from planned spending for the rest of the year in early March. And so that was another uh, kind of extreme measure that we took to try to, to, to you know, fend this thing off. Here's why I'm so proud of our staff and our finance team is, is we, our reserves are very strong. So after many years of being wise and saving and putting some money aside, uh, our, our reserves are, are really helping us. Now, we, we also had budgeted for uh, Harbor Creek and the growth that we expected at Harbor Creek uh, to, to be kind of expanding our budget in these coming months. And we're hitting that period right now. And so we're definitely seeing uh, a little bit of drop off in that. And by the way, um, the, the Grace Harbor Creek thing is, is uh, so frustrating <laughs> uh, because we built this incredible building. Uh, we had this incredible grand opening and all these people coming and, uh, you know, we just pushed pause. And so we've got a building sitting over there that we're, uh, th that's beautiful, that we're paying for, uh, that, that we're not seeing kind of the, the fruit that we expected, obviously, as a result of of that new building and the momentum that comes from it. So part of that momentum we, we built into uh, our projected budgeting. And so, um, yeah, so that's definitely a concern. And, and guys, we're just in uncharted waters. I mean, you know, as, uh, in far, as far as the economy goes. And so this will affect us. You know, we're a, we're a downstream uh, organization. In other words, people's businesses and jobs and things have to be going well for us uh, to be, you know, receiving tithes and offerings that are commensurate with that. And so this will affect us at some point. We're definitely starting to feel it this month, maybe for the first time. And so, you know, I, I guess I would just say to you, if you're able, if you're able to help us uh, to continue to be a life-giving resource to, to you in this digital world and your family and, and everybody, uh, really, including people all over the world, uh, I would just encourage you to please continue to be generous. And there's a bunch of ways that you can do that that you're well aware of at our website, at our app. You can mail stuff in. Um, but we also, I, 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 I want to also just say, I realize that some of you who are watching this are struggling yourself. Like you've lost your job. You're the one in dire financial straits. And, I, and this goes both ways, guys. So if you're in need right now, please reach out. Don't be too proud to reach out. Please reach out. We have a healthy, benevolent fund uh, that's there to help people who are struggling. And so, you know, again, it's a both ways generosity kind of thing. But I, I would urge you, we're doing well so far, but I would urge you to continue to be faithful uh, in your giving because we are expecting this to have some effect on us. The next question, we see other churches doing services. Why can't we? Now, I just want to say that we, you're actually going to see more of this going forward. So churches are going to start opening. Church, some churches already have opened. Some have stayed open, you know, through this. And uh, I've been investing. One of the things I've been spending extra time on is I've been investing in pastors a lot during this time since we started. In fact, I've been having two to three Zoom meetings a week with various groups of pastors that, that I'm connected to. In fact, just this week, I had an opportunity to talk to 400 pastors across Pennsylvania uh, on, a, uh, on a webinar that I was invited to be a, a, a panelist on. And so just uh, kind of have a, a finger on the pulse a little bit of what's going on with pastors. And here's what you need to hear from me, first of all. I will never criticize. I will never criticize what another pastor decides to do uh, as a result of this. Um, as I said earlier, so you have no idea the spiritual and mental toll that goes into deciding what to do on behalf of your church and seeking God, seeking the information, seeking experts, seeking the wisdom of people in your church and your elders. Um, it, it exacts a toll. And I guess what, what you need to hear from me is I'm for the church, and I believe that we need to have a kingdom mindset and not a castle mindset. In other words, we're not just looking at our castle, we're looking at the kingdom. Um, but... Here's why I just want to reiterate, because of our size and complexity, we're in a little bit of a different situation than a lot of churches. And so if a church is, if a church is 25 people or 50 people or 100 people, there are things they may be able to do that we are just not going to be able to do right away. It's going to take us a little bit longer. 
Uh, it's faster to turn a speedboat than it is an aircraft carrier. The aircraft carrier turns a little bit slower. And so um, there's a difference. And, and I would just ask you to be gracious and to be patient and, and to trust that we're making decisions based on what God's asking us to do, based on what our leaders are sensing that God is, is telling us to do in, in this time. And, and to not look around comparatively at other churches, but just to co continue to cheer each other on. All right, here's another question. Is this the end times or the beginning of the end? I got a lot of these questions. So Derek, do you think that you know, we're in the end times or that this is the setup for uh, what's coming at the end of history? And so there are all these stories about you know, a, a one world government and uh, this global suffering and maybe a global currency that this would lead to and tracking and tracing of people in our societies. So let me just say what I've said before as we've talked about end times stuff. Um, there are many very, very smart people who have written books late into the night with wildly different interpretations about what the end times is and is going to be. Different interpretations of the book of Revelation, the book of Daniel. And, and so, so to even answer the question, I have to narrow it down into kind of one sector. So if you're a, a a post-tribulationist, Here's let me talk to you for a minute. That is that you believe that we're going to live through the tribulation. Jesus' second coming isn't going to happen until after we've gone through the, the, the tribulation. Let me just say that when it comes to the end times, and this is going to, when it comes to the end times, we're closer to it every day. And, and yes, it, at some level, the stage is being set. We've never been closer to the end than we are today. Now, let me just bring a little bit of clarity to that. Jesus is talking about in Mark 13, 19, this kind of eschatological section of Scripture. And Jesus says, In those days there will be such tribulation as has not been from the beginning of the creation that God created until now and never will be again. So he said that the tribulation that's going to happen is going to be the worst thing that's ever happened in human history. Now, this isn't it. But here are some of the other things that, that are going to mark that time. There are going to be spiritual impostors. There are going to be global calamities. There's going to be unparalleled persecution of Christians. Uh, there's going to be the rise of someone, an antichrist. There's going to be defections and betrayals, even among family members. Now, here's what I would say to you. There have been many other times in human history where believers thought that they were living through the last days. And, and one of them was right after Jesus died in 70 AD when Jerusalem was sacked. And a guy named Titus came in and he stood in the Holy of Holies and it looked like he was the Antichrist. And so that right away there were people, and you think about the great plagues of history and the other times of persecution that have happened in Rome. There have been a lot of times where Christians said, this is it, this is it. And more recently, the Jesus movement in the 60s and 70s, you know, and, and, and really, whenever our, our culture gets in term, turmoil, we think, well, it must be right now. So in, in the Jesus movement, people said, well, it's surely going to be before 1984. And then it came out later that there was this supercomputer in the Netherlands that was named the Beast, you know, and, and Christians' heads exploded. Uh, and they said, this is it. And, and, and now the cell phone in your pocket has way more capabilities than than the beast in you know, the Netherlands ever had. And when Mussolini was in power, people were saying, you know, this is supposed to be the Antichrist. He, he essentially revived the Roman Empire. That's one of the prophecies. He put 666 on government forms that they used. And, and, and that was a big theory that he was the Antichrist until they lost and he died and, and history moved on. And so if you go back through history, the, many groups had a very convincing reason to think that they were the ones entering into the Great Tribulation. And because of all the speculation, generations of Christians have lived in, in fear. People get weird and avoid computers or credit cards because that might be the mark of the beast. And I just want to remind you, Jesus died for your sins when you were his enemy to save you from hell. I don't think he's going to trick you into hell for getting a credit card. But I say that not to dull our senses. I say that to remind us that we need to be careful about crying wolf every time a new piece of end times evidence emerges. Because you know what happened to the boy who cried wolf? No one believed him when the wolf actually showed up. And so my standard response to people who say, this is it, the apocalypse has arrived, is simply, what are you doing to get ready? 
And if the main thing that you're doing to get ready is to buy a bunch of guns and get a bunker and collect bottled water and canned green beans, you're missing out on what Jesus expects from us. Because nowhere in this text do we see Jesus putting on, you know, sticking a white robe on somebody in heaven and saying, good job for hiding underground and shooting everyone who tried to take your food. No, he's rewarding people for faithful and fearless witness. And so are we in the end times now? I, I don't know. Every day that goes by, we're getting closer. But I think the better question to ask is, how are we preparing for Jesus' return? How are we preparing? Because Jesus is very clear that, that eternal rewards are for the preparers and not the predictors. And so he says things like, stay awake and be on guard. To, to be like the watchman at the door waiting for his master to come back. So, are we in the end times? It's possible. It's, it's very, very possible. And you can see how things are lining up. But I want to make sure that we understand we aren't on the planning committee. We are on the, the welcoming committee. That when Jesus comes back, we are going to be the ones who welcome him back. And the way that we do that best is to prepare every day, to be watchful, to be holy, to, to be reaching out to people like their lives and eternities depend on it because they do. All right, here's another question. Is the government infringing on our religious freedoms with all of this? It's a big question lots of people have. And I've been seeing a lot, of, a lot of people saying, listen, we need to be fighting for our rights. We need to stand up for our rights. And uh, that's a, a, a very American thing to say. Um, you know, part of what, why we escaped the Brits in the first place was for this idea of religious freedom. We wanted to be able to, to practice religious freedom. And so, uh, and it's even kind of gone over into uh, a little to me directly, a little bit more strongly of people saying, listen, you know, now's the time, Pastor, for you to stand up and be like Dietrich Bonhoeffer, you know, against, against Hitler, you know, who was trying to take away the rights of Christians and Bonhoeffer, you know, stood up to him and went to prison for it and was eventually killed for it and all that stuff. And so, so here, here's, my, here's what I've been responding. I just say, well, who in this scenario is Hitler? Um, is it Donald Trump? Is it Governor Wolf? Is it Kathy Dahlkemper? Is it the virus? Like, who, who is the Hitler that I'm supposed to be standing up against? Because this is a very different scenario. In fact, if we're going to go back to history, I've been urging people, if we're going to go back to history and look at historical example of what we should do, we shouldn't go to Hitler. We should go to the 1918 pandemic um, that had wave after wave of people being killed by this thing. That's a more parallel um, you know, historical comparison. It's not Hitler and Bonhoeffer because there's not really a Hitler in this case where there's this coordinated effort. Now, guys, you have to hear me say from my mouth, when and if the time comes to stand up against the government to fight for our rights, I'm, I'm going to be first in line. But we have to choose our battles. And, and I'm not sure that this is a government conspiracy to take over our religious freedoms. I think there's a, a more plain explanation of what's going on here. We have a bit of a perfect storm going on. First thing, we've never been through a global pandemic before as a people. So no one knows what they're doing. <laughs> the, the, the government officials don't know what they're doing. The scientists don't know what they're doing. The police don't know what they're doing. We're, we're working through something for the first time. And so you're gonna get wildly different reactions and responses to this thing because we don't know what we're doing. There's been a problem with data integrity as it relates to this. We've been seeing that all over the place. We're not sure how many people have it. That There were post-tests done in Southern California that say way, way more people have it than we ever thought had it, which makes the death rates go way down. So, so there's a data issue going on that's, that's hard to get our hands around. So that whenever data comes out, it's A, seen as untrustworthy, be, you know, people can lump it into a conspiracy theory quickly and say, well, here, see, this is what's actually happening. And add to that, there's a lot of misinformation going on right now. And so I just want to say, okay, is there a coordinated effort to take away our religious freedoms? I don't think there is. But, but there are agendas happening all over this thing, which, which become confusing. And so, okay, just think it through. Think of all the agendas at play, all right? President Trump and his administration have an agenda to try to get reelected. And so you have to know that that's a filter that's going into this. The Democrats have an agenda to keep that from happening. And, and so you have to know that that's a filter that's going into this. The media has an agenda to keep this hyped up so that their ratings are good. It's a money thing. 
We find out hospitals have an agenda to call things COVID virus uh, because they're getting a lump sum payment every time somebody dies of the virus in their hospitals. And so we're finding out, you know, people who had pre-existing conditions, you know, the, the joke is, you know, somebody got hit by a bus and they had a fever when it happened, so they died of coronavirus, right? So the hospital can get money. So, so there's an agenda there. You know, you see videos, the, the two doctors out in California or whatever, these guys are running a small business. And so they have an agenda that the country would open back up. And so, yeah, there's truth in all of these things, but there's also an agenda in all of these things. You know, I saw a thing about hydroxychloroquine or whatever, this drug that, you know, so there's a guy in a white lab coat saying, I'm a scientist and hydroxychloroquine is safe. Well, you find out later that the guy is a salesman for this drug that includes, so, so there's agendas all over the place. And, and so to try to think that, okay, this is a coordinated effort to take down the church, I think is, is missing the point of what's going on. However, I think it's important for us to always have a healthy skepticism of the media, a healthy skepticism of the government, um, without going into full-blown conspiracy theory. And that's the tough part. You know, because we hear stories about the, the media giants editing things. You know, YouTube editing things and Google editing things and Facebook and Twitter taking things down or whatever. And the problem is they have a history of editing, you know, a lot of Christian things or more conservative things. And so, but here's what I would say to you. If YouTube deletes a video, that doesn't automatically mean that that video is true. Like I'm seeing a lot of people go, watch this video before it gets deleted. Well, the vast majority of videos that are being deleted are being deleted because they're not true and there's misinformation. So don't just assume because something's being deleted, well, that must be true. Um, but I want to come back to this idea of like, should we right now be fighting for our rights, uh, fighting for our religious freedoms? Um, and, and let me just say this as a precursor. Uh, in Pennsylvania, for example, where we're located, at no point has the church been forced to close down. We've always been, from the very beginning, considered an essential business. And so if you want to blame somebody for that, you can blame me. Uh, because it, in the end, it was my decision for us to shut down. And here's why. And here's why I'm not sure it's a fight for your rights issue. Because there's this other thing. I'm not sure fighting for our rights is exactly biblical. But there's this other thing, this other factor that I think goes into it. It's an idea called the common good. It, it, Aristotle talked about it way back when. I think the Apostle Paul picked up on it. Jesus, obviously. Uh, but it was kind of popularized by Pope Leo. But the, the, the common good is just defined as the flourishing of persons in a community. That there should be an, a sense that, that we are all fighting for the common good. And I heard Andy Crouch give a talk where he said that the best test uh, of the common good is when you look at a specific community to test if they are about the common good is the flourishing of the vulnerable in that community. Like how are the vulnerable doing in that community? And the vulnerable, the youngest in the community, the oldest in the community, the most frail in the community, the most marginalized in the community. How, how, are, the, how are the vulnerable doing? And, and we see this through the Bible, from the Old Testament to the New. The Old Testament, some of God's judgments were connected to not caring for the vulnerable. You hear James say that, that the religion that is pure and undefiled is the religion where, where you care for the orphans and the widow, widows, and that you're unstained by the world. Jesus obviously said things like, love your neighbor as yourself. Love as I have loved you. Love your enemy. Galatians 5.13 says, don't use your freedom to indulge the flesh, but serve one another in love. 1 Peter says, use whatever gift you have received to serve others. And so there's this idea, I think, through the scriptures that we're to be caring for the vulnerable, that we're to be looking out for the common good of the communities that we live in. And so I, I put this in that category. To me, this isn't a fight for our rights or religious freedoms category because I don't think they're being violated, to be honest with you. I think it's a let's fight for the common good. Let's fight as a church to love our neighbors, to love well. And yeah, religious freedom is always going to be at risk. There's always going to be social hostility that comes against us. There will always be you know, the threat of government restrictions. And I think we need to be very mindful of those things. So I'm not saying that, that, that that's not, you know, valid. And, and listen, there are examples of overreach going on right now. 
I mean, I heard, and again, these are pockets, but I heard about the, you know, the LA mayor this week who basically said, we're staying in lockdown until there's a cure. Like, come on, dude. That's, that's not realistic. Illinois, the governor of Illinois is doing some overreach as it comes to churches. And so there, there's, there is some overreach going on. But here we've been essential from day one. And our decisions to close our buildings for a time and even to, to keep our buildings closed for a little bit longer to prevent a second wave is being born out of this idea of the common good. What does it look like to love our neighbor? What does it look like to love the vulnerable ones in our community? Um, I think we should be leading the world in love. And I think we have a great uh, example in Daniel uh, chapter 1. Uh, early in the book of Daniel there, he, Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, remember, they were in a, under a foreign government. They were in exile. They faced a, a couple of options that, that weren't great. And what you saw Daniel do is he quietly chose a third alternative, and he put conditions around that. Um, and, and later, they stood up. When the time came to stand up, they stood up. But until then, they, they kind of just chose a different alternative. And during disruptions like this, I think that it's the innovators that come out on top. And I think that if, if we look at the situation and go, we're, our, our religious freedoms aren't being violated. We're still allowed to meet as a church online. We're still allowed to get together in small groups. That's all we need for right now. So we're not being violated. What can we do for the common good? How can we lead the world in love? And now, how can we innovate and press the church forward during this disruption? All right, another question is, how can we keep doing God's work when we're in quarantine? So yeah, it's tough because we've been kind of closed in our houses, and so how do we be the hands and feet of Jesus? And I, I would just take you again to a website that we created called Be the Church. Uh, there's options there, safe alternatives to being able to serve during this time. Just this week, we had 1,500 cookies go to 18 nursing homes, uh, which have been really on the front lines of all this to tell those workers how much we love them and so that they can pass along that love to the residents. Um, we've been distributing care packages. Our church sent 400 care packages that were distributed to people like uh, St. Patrick's Haven and Erie City Mission and SafeNet and the Avalon Emergency Shelter and Bethany Outreach. And uh, there, there's one great story where there's a, a, a nun uh, that, uh, you know, that was kind of working with these groups that received our care packages, and she loved the care packages. She said, these are the best ones we've ever gotten, these Ziploc bags with small items. Uh, they weren't on bags that could tear. She said it was the best thing that she's seen so far. And so, again, kudos, Grace Church. Servieri has been very active in coordinating volunteerism, and so if you're interested in serving, uh, you can go to serviri.com. Uh, but, but even beyond that, I think we have a unique opportunity right now to do front yard missions. That, that we would be neighboring really well. And one of the nagging questions that I've had since this whole thing has started is how do we reach the people in our community who didn't know they needed a church until right now? Like there's people who right now in the midst of this are going, man, there's something missing in my life. I didn't realize it was missing until this moment. How can we be there to fill in the blanks for them that what they need is Jesus? that he's the answer to their problems. And so guys, as your neighbors are out walking more and more these days, as the weather gets nicer, um, and because there's not a whole lot else to do yet, man, seize the moment, press through the awkward of, hey, we've lived next to each other for eight years and I still don't know your name. What's your name? Um, and, and, and press in. You know, the, our slogan for this uh, vision initiative that we're in right now, Transform 1-8, the slogan went from the beginning was transformed communities through transformed people. And that we can transform the communities that we're a part of when we ourselves are transformed. And so as you press into Jesus during this time, there's this overflow that happens in the people around you. And we just have a great opportunity to do that right now. Another question is, has this opened up any possibilities that we hadn't been thinking of before? So yeah, I think there are some great opportunities that have opened up as a result of this. Again, I wouldn't have you know, wanted to go through this to discover, but God makes beauty from ashes. And, and so um, you know, I think there are some things like, man, the connection between our pastors and our congregations. And so what's happening on Facebook Live, what's happening in these special Facebook groups, uh, the phone calls that have happened within our congregations have been really, really cool. And uh, this allowed us to kind of explore those things when we may not have before. 
I also think about just the, the direct connection that it's given me and some of our other leaders here at Grace with uh, leaders of different groups. And so, I mean, the technology's always been there, but it's like we've just rediscovered it. And so, you know, I, I, I was able to hop on a meeting with 80 of our life group leaders the other day and just have a direct conversation with people that it doesn't seem like happens as easily when, when we're in person. And so that's been a cool innovation is just our connection with our leaders. Another one is kind of a, a go backward to, to versus forward thing, but you know, the, what, what happened in, uh, on TV on Easter, you know, I, I've never been a real big televangelist guy, uh, but all of a sudden we have our Easter services on TV and, and find, this, uh, find this new opportunity there that, that was really incredible. We had, uh, I just saw the numbers yesterday, we had over 10,000 people watch our Easter services, which is really, really incredible. So, uh, so that's been a, an innovation that I didn't see coming. It's allowed us to set ourselves up on YouTube. And uh, that, that may not seem like a huge thing, but it forced our hand to kind of go there. And we had already been setting things up, but to really make that one of our platforms, uh, YouTube is the number one way people around the world take in screen content. And so, um, you know, to, to be able to begin to establish ourselves there, we've been talking about it for a long time, but this kind of forced our hand to do that. So, you know, and we're still figuring out online services. What, is, what does music look like for an online audience in, in, in their living rooms? What does communion look like? What does preaching look like? Uh, what do interactions look like online? But, uh, you know, I think it's forcing our hand there that, that, that's an important uh, innovation. Last one. Shouldn't we be living in faith and not fear? Shouldn't we be living in faith and not fear? And we've heard this from the very beginning. And let me just say this. The, the simple answer is yes. And I would add a caveat that those aren't the only two options. So faith and fear aren't the only two options. There's also stupid. And so some people are living in stupid. And that's not great. Um, but there, there's also kind of an added uh, element to faith that says wisdom. And so I, I know what people mean when they say this, and that is, shouldn't we just gather back together again and trust that God has it all, that it's all worked out, that even if we don't wear masks, even if we just slam people into the room, that, that that's faith, and God has always honored our faith, and, and God does honor our faith. But there's also this thing called natural laws. And I'll, I'll give you another example. If you were to, to go skydiving without a parachute, and you just said, hey, I'm going to go up in this plane, and I'm going to jump out of this plane, and the law of gravity is going to take over, um, but I'm, I have faith in God. Like, that's not fear of faith. That's stupid. Because you're testing the laws that God has put in place, these natural laws. So don't test gravity and call it faith. And there's a biblical example of this when Jesus was being tempted by the devil in Luke 4. And, and, and the devil takes him up onto the pinnacle of the temple, and he says, I want you to throw yourself down. What's he asking him to do? I'm asking you to test natural laws. Test the law of gravity. Because God can bring angels and catch you and all that. Do you remember Jesus' response to Satan? He says, don't put the Lord to the test. Don't put the Lord to the test. And I think this is a guiding principle for us right now, guys. The natural laws involve and include the laws of how a virus operates. And there are good sides of that. There are good viruses that spread all the time that God set it up that way. But there are also these bad results of viruses. And I think one of our guiding principles needs to be, we're not going to put God to the test and call it faith. We're not living in fear, but we're being wise. And I think there's a time to be wise, and that's what we're trying to do. So, hey, I love you guys. It was fun to join you. I'm glad if, if you hung through the end of this, man, God bless you. You're awesome. And uh, I miss you. I can't wait until we can be together again. And I hope this has helped to, uh, help to frame your thinking on some of these things. God bless you.